Okay. Hello there, this is Kendo Nagasaki, Peter Thornley, the man behind the mask, and I am watching Cheap Shot Entertainment this afternoon and, and this morning and tonight. Hope you all join me. Bye! Promotional consideration paid for by the following. <laughs> This is awesome! Hello and welcome to another review, a retro review with In the Year 2024. It's 20 years ago today since the Royal Rumble, the 17th Royal Rumble, took place in Philadelphia, uh, now known as the Wells Fargo Center, and was at the time known as the Wachova Center. Don't forget to like and subscribe, of course, to the videos uh, on YouTube. And if you're listening to this as a pure podcast, same goes for there as well. Uh, to get all of the notifications, don't forget to ring that bell. So it's a joint pay per view between Raw and SmackDown since the brand split all of the big four are dual pay-per-views and there's like a, a battle between the two to get the better matches which is pretty cool because they all pull out the stops um, at this point in time like most of the, uh, the, the brand warfare I feel that SmackDown was much stronger uh, even though Raw was the flagship brand and had its fair share of uh, people on there that could do the job. But as a uh, host team uh, watching wrestling um, in 2004, Smackdown was the only thing that was available to me on Sky 1. And that was played on a Saturday morning, which made it even better because obviously I was out and about doing things at the time um so <clears throat> yeah we're in philadelphia the city of brotherly love uh not the city of brother love you know the i love you um <laughs> but the city of brotherly love and of course king and jr are representing raw and they are joined by the coach on commentary and Taz and Cole are representing the SmackDown brand. There's also a Spanish announce table, so you know that that's going to go through um, when it comes down to it. So in terms of the theme song, it is Left to Lose by Puddle of Mud. Uh, the main event, obviously, is the 30-man Royal Rumble. This was way before they did the 30-woman Royal Rumble as well. Although it did have its odd smatterings of representation for the female superstars of WWE uh, going through it. Um, it features on the games WWE 2K15, WWE WrestleMania 21, WWE SmackDown vs. Raw and WWE Day of Reckoning. So the same as we had before um, for the last pay-per-view of the year which was Armageddon in 2003 uh, a good representation of all um, things there in terms of consoles for like Xbox we've got PlayStation 2 and we've got uh, um, that would have been GameCube I would have believe I would believe uh, day of reckoning and of course 2k15 which represented all of the above just before we go into the main pay-per-view we did have a match on Sunday Night Heat and it was Victoria versus Molly Holly where Victoria was victorious uh, over the uh, former champion I would imagine actually um, didn't really check that one probably should have anyway let's move into the uh, pay-per-view now and we're starting with the Raw World Tag Team Championships, and it is Bubba Ray and Devon, the Dudley Boys, 
uh, trying to retain, trying to regain rather, not retain, but trying to regain their championships uh, from Ric Flair and Batista of Evolution, who won those championships at Armageddon in a tag team turmoil match. Uh, the Dudleys start this one quick as they attack after Batista insults the local sports team. Insert cheap heat here. Um, it's tornado rules. Uh, Flair is attacked by um, by the table, and <laughs> other uh, and after Batista saves him from going through said table. This is, of course, a tables match, which I didn't mention at the start of going through the match and giving you my ratings. Um, you've got the um, Going forward, Batista is just really angry and just beats everyone up. I'm pretty sure he'd beat Ric Flair up if he if he could, if he wasn't tagging with him. Um, 3D on Batista is missed after the corner charge. Oh, after the corner charge, so they they hit the 3D. It's a 3D B officially on the games, which is like a belly to back. Uh, not a belly to back suplex, a sort of lift up shoulder suplex and a neck breaker. Um, so it's like you're going up for a atomic drop. I can't think what that suplex is called now. Um, so back suplex, we'll just call it a back suplex. And um, into the neck break, and that's a 3D B. Uh, and that's done after Batista misses a corner charge. So he's getting angry at this point, but he's making mistakes. Um, Coach comes down to the ring and distracts the Dudley boys. And they've been having the feud on and off for a couple of months now where the coach was in charge of Raw and picking on the Dudley boys. Uh, insert heel authority figure picking on face tag team putting them in all sorts of situations where they probably would have gotten beaten up um but with the redemption being that the face team comes out on top and then it's vintage flair with a dive from the top as he gets cut off as well um batista Comes in after pushing Devon from the top rope as he goes for the weather. And we get a spine buster through the table to retain the championships. Um, I'm going to give this one three out of five cheap shots because basically there was that distraction by the coach. It was a good, it was a good match, really well structured um, for a tag team tables match. Uh, something that I've not really witnessed, I don't think, in person in the local uh, British indie scene. I've certainly not seen anything like that at Aspire. Although we did have a three stages of hell match back in November, which was absolutely awesome. Um, and so you pick up on certain things and... With this one, it was definitely the distraction. Um, but because of the tornado rules, it made sense. No one could get disqualified, etc., etc., etc. But I feel like, again, given more time, it would have gotten a higher, higher rating, maybe 3.5. However, you've got the Royal Rumble coming up at the end of the night. And with the pay-per-views usually being three hours at this point in time, um, you didn't have a lot of time for the pre-matches, but they, they needed to happen. So, decent match, good opener. Three out of five soup shots on that one. We join Josh Matthews in the back as he is interviewing John Cena. And um, he's doing all his rapping stuff. And then RVD appears and goes, RVD. And then Josh, John Cena tells him to go suck his candy cane. Uh, Yep, <laughs> this is rapper John Cena, um, but it's definitely on the nose. Um, so we then move on to the second match, which is the Cruiserweight Championship, and it is Rey Mysterio who is 
the current reigning defending champion, versus JB Noble with Nydia, who is in a storyline where she's blind and she's using a stick and all that kind of stuff. And the storyline is that she's still uh, Jamie Noble's uh, girlfriend, but Jamie Noble keeps putting her in, in increasingly dangerous situations with uh, with how the matches are progressing. So there is two contrasting styles here. Rey Mysterio is more of a high flying uh, cruiserweight, whereas Jamie Noble is a ground and bound cruiserweight, which is very different to what the cruiserweight style um, most people think of when they when they hear cruiserweight. Um, this is a crazy fast start to this match. It is, um, like I say, contrast of two styles. Rey Mysterio is trying to jump off everything and bounce everywhere, whereas Jamie Noble is trying to stop him and ground him and take him to the mat. Um, it would be uh, Nydia uh, tripping Noble um, because obviously she can't see. That's that's the whole idea here. She is blind and uh, she trips Noble and Mysterio retains with the 619 and springboard leg drop after that. So um, obviously he's distracted. Rey Mysterio gets the drop kick 619. Set, uh, springboard leg drop. And Mysterio retains. Um, again, <laughs> I'm going to give this two cheap shots, cheap shots out of five because um, I feel like it could have been much better. It had a really good start, it had really good structure, but they were only given a certain amount of time. I get it. Um, Cruiserweight Championship was very much an under undercard, but I will say this, and I've said this before on the podcast, that the Cruiserweights at this time had some of the best storylines and the best matches on the card and it could have been given just that little tiny bit longer um and again i've said you know this one had potential but it wasn't given the time to fully realize that um we move on again um to the next match it is a family feud it is the guerreros going one on one chavo jr with Chavo Senior, who is Eddie Guerrero's brother in in real life, not in kayfabe, um, and um, their tag team has imploded. Um, they were really good. They were really popular. They rode together. They seated together. Um, they went out together they dined together they did everything together because that's what family do and um, it is a case of a tag team imploding they saw the potential in eddie and they wanted to give him a little bit of a push so that's exactly what they did and the uh, deception was in place they were tag team champions up to very recently before this feud and uh, yeah they just sort of fell out um, but obviously, like I say, Chavo Sr. is at ringside with his real-life brother. We start off with a lock-up and a slap by Chavo Guerrero Jr. Um, uh, complete sign of disrespect there for his uncle. Uh, lock-up again, and this time a chop from Eddie, and uh, you know, giving, in, giving Chavo a receipt. Uh, we then get a chop-off. And an eye poke by Eddie Guerrero. By this point, he was the lying, cheating, stealing Eddie Guerrero that we all love. And um, yeah, he, he quite often got away with little things like this because people liked it. And um, you know, they would they would chant his name, and he was obviously very popular. Action spills to the outside and breaks down into a full-on fist fight. Uh, we get the three amigos and a frog splash for the win from Eddie. And uh, as Chavo Sr. is trying to enter the match and uh, trying to attack Eddie, uh, um, Eddie kicks him uh, below the uh, below the belt and gives him a chop. Um, and uh, uh, sorry, punches him in the chops and then gives him a low blow. 
so yeah, really, really good match. This is a match to watch if you're a student of the game. Um, like I say, none of these matches were given very much time, but I feel like because these two knew each other inside and out, you've got more bang for your buck. Every single minute was used perfectly. Uh, the outside interference and everything along those lines. Like I say, once again, it was because it was um, cut short, in my opinion, but you get that with Royal Rumbles. Uh, 3.5 cheap shots out of 5. And uh, after the match, uh, Eddie starts beating up Chavo, and uh, that's where uh, Senior comes in and gets his kick to the lower extremities. We're going back to Josh Matthews now, and he's talking to Fresh Air and uh, is duly interrupted by Evolution, saying that Fresh Air will never, ever win the uh, championship, never, ever win the Royal Rumble, and the numbers game, of course, is in their favour. And by Fresh Air, I mean... Um, <laughs> the name that shall not be said um, and uh, Ric Flair I've noted is a little bit premature with the champagne because pops his cork really really quickly Right, so your next match is for the WWE Championship, which is exclusive to SmackDown at this point in time, owing to Stephanie McMahon signing Brock Lesnar exclusively to the blue brand. This match does have a quite a hefty backstory to it, in that Hardcore Holly was going against Brock Lesnar, and Brock Lesnar would lift Holly up for a power bomb and drop him right on his neck, breaking his neck. Uh, and that is an actual injury that Hardcore Holly suffered in the hands of Brock Lesnar. So this one is the redemption story. Can Hardcore Holly win the championship? Can he overcome the man who broke his neck? And of course, Hardcore Holly is no stranger to hard-hitting competition and he gets that with Brock Lesnar absolutely positively but Holly would not even let Brock Lesnar get into the ring um, uh, and rushes Brock Lesnar uh, only for uh, Brock Lesnar to go into the post a couple of times um, after a little bit of brawling on the outside, bearing in mind the ring bell hasn't even been rung yet, uh, Brock Lesnar would get back on top with a suplex uh, and Brock Lesnar would be back in control fairly quickly with this one. Uh, it would be Lesnar that slows it down now with a bear hug and grapevines the leg. So Hardcore Holly has very little chance of escaping this. We do get some chance of boring here um, from the crowd who don't appreciate the Matt wrestling style of Brock Lesnar, and that would obviously lead to other things later in the year. Um, we get a compact fisherman's buster from Brock Lesnar, which is absolutely beautiful. What a move. And um, goes back to the ribs, and uh, into an overhead belly to belly suplex with a butterfly grip, um, which is the double underhook, and uh, that is pretty darn cool. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, Brock, uh, sorry, break out by Hardcore Holly, and uh, he goes into a full Nelson. Both roll out of the ring and then come back into the ring. Um, obviously, the roll out of the ring is to break the hold. Uh, it is Brock Lesnar with the butterfly lock. And um, uh, both get back in the ring. 
it would be an F5 from Brock Lesnar and a spirited performance and uh, spirited fight from Hardcore Holly, but ultimately the power game of the young champion would come into play here. F5 for the win. Um, and like I said, Hardcore Holly giving Brock a very tough match. I've given this one 2.5 cheap shots out of 5 because it was done at the spare of a moment on the spare of the moment but also it did tell a, a good story um ultimately the contrast of styles and i still feel like um Harker holly was being protected a little bit here as, as they should all wrestlers should be a little bit protected especially coming back off an injury but uh yeah uh thoroughly entertaining again probably wasn't given enough time but they did enough with the experience um that they both have to make the match interesting we move on to the world heavyweight championship now which is exclusively on raw and to bring you up to speed that was reintroduced when stephanie mcmahon signed brock lesnar exclusively to smackdown with the wwe undisputed championship he, eric bischoff brought back the big gold belt and that is when triple h won it and that would have been around about two years before this um, with, uh, like I say, Eric Bischoff taking over Raw and bringing back the big gold belt, which he was so synonymous with um, back on WCW. This is your second match with uh, stipulation, and it is a last man standing match, making sure that Triple H can't weasel his way out. He can't cheat to win, and it has to be a full on match um there would be some claret during this match um and we get a hellacious start we get one of the best starts to a match that i've ever seen actually um because like i say it is a last man standing match they could go straight for chairs they could go straight for the big heavy hitters hitting um foreign objects um and uh, they don't. They go straight into a lockup. There's some good chain wrestling here. And I would, again, encourage any aspiring uh, wrestling student to have a look at this because you wonder why you do all the basics in training. Well, this is why. Even Triple H and Shawn Michaels can put on a good match, starting with the basics the lockup, the armbar, the um hammer lock the headlock the you know um whatever it is wrist wrist lock um and, the, and they can do all that and it will still be entertaining like i say one of the best starts um to a match that i've seen for for a long time they kind of they kind of lose touch with those basics these days um including you know like i'll say this and i'll say this out loud the effectiveness of a super kick has now been just watered down to the extent where I don't even go, oh, look, there's a super kick. Uh, but again, these are the basics. Why not start up with, why not start with a lockup when you get into a match? And it's something that British wrestling does quite well, actually, um, with the lockups, because this is how we, this is how we, how we train. Um, and after a hellacious match, uh, it has blood. It has tables. Do you know the Spanish announce table that I mentioned? Yep. <laughs> it gets broken during this match. Um, blood, tables, chairs. We've got super kicks in there as well. Um, and, and neither could answer the count of 10 after a basically what was a rocky finish and a double count out uh, and triple h retains the championship via count out if he, if they both lose triple h retains the championship also makes saw michaels look very strong in this one because both are completely knocked out and it you know the super kick and uh, i think it's possibly the hammer at the same time i don't know how um that even works but they made it work and uh, both end up leaving on stretches. But Michaels um, 
as uh, JR would put it, the crazy SOB um, would demand to walk out of the arena himself. Uh, both get a rousing round of applause and a lot of respect from the crowd. This is a great match and uh, should be watched by all. If you're squeamish, I wouldn't watch it. <laughs> there is claret. There is uh, there's a lot of bodies going through things, but it is simple. It is effective. And the use of blood does actually make this match much more interesting. It's not just done for the sake of doing it. It is um, one of those things. It's literally a blood feud. <laughs> Every time these guys have a one on one, there's blood. Um, and it back in the day, it was few and far between, and it was it was good. Um, like I say, nearly perfect. Four point five out of five. Once that match is finished, Bischoff interrupts the Fink and says, "Raw is better." Heyman enters, followed by Stone Cold Steve Austin on a quad, and gives stunners. All round, of course, Heyman thinks that SmackDown is better. He is the current uh, general manager of SmackDown. After all these hijinks, Terry talks to Goldberg and he says he's got to win the Royal Rumble. He's going in at number 30. He's got a good chance. Uh, and he's interrupted by Brock Lesnar, uh, who, <laughs> who Goldberg scares by saying, Hey, look behind you. Is that hardcore, hardcore Holly? <laughs> uh, simple, effective. Um, and and uh, I won't spoil it, but I think you probably know both would leave the, leave the company not for long after this. Um, and then it's now time for the Royal Rumble. And for the first time at the end of January, in fact, it will be tomorrow as we're thinking about it. Yes. Um, let me check that. <laughs> uh, this is yeah. So this is going out. It's twenty fifth. Going out on Thursday. Yeah. So as we're speaking, it's tomorrow that I'll be uh, ring announcing on our very own R Rumble Royal. I can't say that it's a Royal Rumble because this copyright infringement. Uh, I'll be ring announcing that my first ever Rumble. I'm quite looking forward to it. So. Uh, yeah, well, um, I'll let you know how that goes next month when we do No Way Out. Um, so the participants in this match, in order, Chris Benoit starts at number one, followed by Randy Orton, uh, Mark Henry, Tajiri, Bradshaw, Rhino, Matt Hardy, Scott Steiner, um, Matt Morgan, The Hurricane, Booker T, Kane, Spike Dudley, Rikishi, Rene Dupree, A Train, Shelton Benjamin, Ernest Miller, Ernest the Cat Miller, somebody call my mama. That's before the uh, um, Funkasaurus used that music. Kurt Angle, the wrestling machine, Rico with his massive sideburns. Mick Foley makes a makes a uh, entrance in this match because all the way through the show, um, it was said that Mick Foley would have a seat at ringside and he was expected to appear, but he didn't. And then he came out during the Royal Rumble and it was cool. Christian, Christian, now you're on your own. He's next, followed by Nunzio and the FBI. Big Show, well, makes a entrance next, followed by Chris Jericho, Charlie Haas, Billy Gunn, John Cena, Rob Van Dam, and finally Goldberg. Um, of course, all these people went in, all, in the ring all at the same time. However, um, you know, they are the Rumbles. And I thought, actually, this was one of the better Rumbles in the 2000s. Um, but obviously, the winner has some doubt cast over it for a couple of years uh, of down the line. Uh, things would happen um, in real life <laughs> that uh, tainted his legacy. And, um, yeah, if we just, again, look at it from a pure wrestling point of view, Chris Benoit was absolutely bloody brilliant. Um, in real life, not so much. 
so <clears throat> yeah I feel like this this is a tainted pay-per-view um, with Chris Benoit winning but obviously they weren't to know and it was a good choice at the time people wanted it and it and they got it so you know in that respect uh, at this point in time Benoit was absolute fire I'm not going to grade the Royal Rumble uh, for 2004 um, the Royal Rumble match anyway because it's really difficult to grade but I do feel like it's one of the better ones overall a really good show and there's very little little to dislike apart from the length of some of the matches um, definitely one to go back and watch in my opinion um, even watch this with my dad and even he liked it so you know he spends most of his time going to it fake um, no, it's not. I uh, I hurt myself in training a couple of weeks ago, and it took about three or four weeks to get over it. So, uh, yeah, accidents do happen. Injuries do happen. Do not try this at home. Heed the words of WWE. And if you want to uh, get into wrestling, find your local wrestling school and learn it properly because you can get hurt um, very much. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that is the Royal Rumble for... 2004 Chris Benoit winning the Royal Rumble match and going on to Wrestlemania for his title shot but who will he pick um, well time will tell and uh, we move on to No Way Out on February the 15th um, which is a Smackdown brand exclusive so we'll um, we'll see you then uh, thank you very much for watching the video podcast listening to the podcast however you join us we're grateful for every single one of you you are the cheap shot nation i have been your host luke this has been talk is cheap for the retro reviews goodbye